Hello everyone and welcome to what will be a very exciting panel discussion on the e-commerce sector in MENA. Um, my name is Triska Hamid, I'm the editor at WAMDA and um, WAMDA last year partnered up with the Legatum Centre for Development and Entrepreneurship at MIT and uh, as part of this partnership we created a white paper on the impact of the pandemic on the e-commerce sector in the Middle East region. We're publishing the, the white paper today. It's available in both English and Arabic on the WAMDA website and the Legatum Center website. Before we start our panel discussion, uh, Julia and I will very briefly go over the main insights and the policy recommendations of the report. First thing to bear in mind is that the e-commerce sector was already growing prior to the pandemic. From 2015 to 2017, the sector had almost doubled in size, uh, reaching $8.3 billion in valuation. What the pandemic did was supercharge this growth. And by the end of 2020, uh, the sector was worth $22 billion. Much of this was driven by the UAE, Saudi Arabia and Egypt, which together account for 80% of the region's overall e-commerce market. This growth had a ripple effect on other sectors in the economy particularly logistics and fintech. We saw a rise in the number of last mile delivery companies and more innovation in the fintech space, particularly in digital payments. One example is Buy Now Pay Later, which is still enjoying a lot of adoption these days. As countries shut down their borders, cross-border trade become, it became very difficult. And so this increased demand for local suppliers. We also saw hyperlocalization, particularly in the e-grocery space, where many players established dark stores to fulfill orders quickly. The fear of spreading the virus via services resulted in a decreased dependency on cash on delivery. Saudi Arabia banned cash payments for online orders altogether. But as things have slowly returned back to normal, we've, we've seen a bounce back in COD as of late. During the height of the lockdowns, uh, many offline retailers scrambled to establish an online presence, and this is where marketplaces like Noon and Amazon made an impact. Others, without the capabilities, used social media platforms like Facebook and WhatsApp and Instagram to communicate, advertise and sell their products and services. Last year, we also saw the launch of super apps, namely Karim and Halan in Egypt, whose last mile capabilities and digital wallets have provided a means for offline retailers to establish some sort of presence online. Julia? All right, um, and I will talk about the four policy recommendations that came from the research we conducted. Number one is to transform the trust-based economy. So we saw a decline in cash on delivery, as Triska mentioned, and then we saw a return to cash on delivery. However, we believe that consumers adjusted to using online and electronic payments, and that this trend could continue with the right policies in place. The second recommendation is to foster entrepreneurship ecosystems. So we recommend extending visas to employees of startups, providing credit, and encouraging local and international entrepreneurs to bring their solutions to market. We also believe that governments can invest in infrastructure to support SMEs um, and create small business hubs that support e-commerce startups. Um, our third recommendation is to create unified markets. So we learned from our research that some of the greatest challenges for entrepreneurs and for businesses are lack of standard standards um, for which kinds of products can be imported and exported between countries. Um, this means that they have to have multiple warehouses and multiple sets of regulations. Um, streamlining this would bring efficiencies for businesses um, and policies would include creating common standards um, for currency exchanges as well. Our final recommendation is to promote the digitization and technology adoption. Um, so we believe that technology adoption on the part of SMEs and consumers um, allows SMEs to reach broader markets and it allows consumers to re, uh, access essential goods and services. So we re recommend that countries invest in platform companies um, and promoting digitization um, to allow multiple stakeholders to engage in their economies. And with that, I will hand it over to our moderator today, uh, Dina Sheriff. All right, thank you so much, Julia. 
I can ask the panelists to turn their videos on at this stage so I can introduce them. For those who don't know me, I'm the executive director of the Legatum Center uh, for Development and Entrepreneurship at MIT. And it's been a real pleasure to work with WAMDA on this white paper. Um, before we get started on the amazing group of, uh, with the amazing group of panelists we have, I just wanted to thank everyone involved from both WAMDA and the Gautam Center in this white paper. It was a research, I think when you read it, you rarely realize the amount of effort that gets put into it and a huge amount of effort was put in. So I just wanted to thank Triska and Julia again for leading those efforts. Quickly introduce our amazing panelists. Of course, Fedi Handur doesn't really need introduction, the executive chairman of WAMDA Capital. Uh, we have Sherry Lasberg, senior lecturer in technological innovation, entrepreneurship and strategic management at MIT Sloan, uh, and also somebody who very much is interested in the Middle East. Um, Mohamed Alkesha, who is co-founder in Faudi and managing partner of Disrupt Tech. Mona Ateya, who is the founder and CEO of Mums World, and Faraz Khaled, who is the CEO of Noon. Thank you all for joining us. Um, Fedi, I really wanna start with you to get a, get a start to this discussion and kick it off. So over the past decade, I'd say we've seen a slow and then a relatively rapid progression of e-commerce take hold in the region. What was happening in the e-commerce sector pre-pandemic and how did the pandemic actually accelerate e-commerce? And what do we need to sustain that acceleration? Yeah, thank you, Dina. Hello, uh, everyone. I also want to thank uh, uh, the MIT Legatum Center, Dina, Shari, and everyone, and my team, Triska, for all the hard work that you put in, in, in bringing up this important paper uh, on e-commerce. Look, uh, I mean, I, there are more and bigger uh, knowledge uh, uh, experts on this uh, subject, Faraz and Muna, uh, they have experienced it uh, uh, hands-on uh, day in and day out. But e-commerce e was happening in the region, was happening rapidly. Uh, I mean, uh, looking at Noon itself and its rise uh, and its ability to compete with, with the global giants like, uh, like Amazon and uh, in the horizontal space, which is the most difficult uh, space to compete in, is a testament to uh, to the fact that this this region was hungry for e-commerce. Uh, the young population who are completely engaged, uh, mobile, and uh, and willing to actually transact online, uh, uh, and these companies were were uh, reflecting the needs of of the marketplace at the end of the uh, at the end of the day. And uh, this was a global trend, and the region is not out of that global trend. I mean, I, I don't know why. Uh, there is that uh, that continuous question, you know, what is the region part of it or not? Well, yes, yes. I mean, the world is, is has shrunk uh, with the internet a long time ago. <laughs> and those who didn't realize it, realized it during the pandemic very quickly and uh, and paid for it very dearly. Uh, and then, uh, but but big lessons, big lessons that came, uh, came from it. So uh, I would say that... Um, we were there, uh, the region was there, it was happening. There were a lot of things that needed to be done. Uh, like every early, uh, 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 you know, we were in the early stages of that uh, uh, trend in the region. And uh, slowly we're getting there. I mean, it's, it's, there's, I mean, China went through it, the US went through it back in, in uh, when Amazon came out in 1996, etc. Uh, Europe is going through it and went through it. So, I, I mean, it's, it's just give us some time and you'll see us getting there. But, you know, the pandemic just got everyone so much faster into where we, we really uh, think we want it to be uh, uh, maybe five years down the road, but it's happening now. Yeah, Fedi, just a quick follow-up. I've heard a lot my, myself, I've heard a lot of investors criticize other, um, be critiqued for investing too heavily in e-commerce uh, across the Middle East. Um, but it sounds like with what you're saying, they were making the right decisions. Can, can you maybe share a little bit of your views of the potential that e-commerce has to impact economically the region? Look, I, I believe uh, commerce reflects the real economy at the end of the day. And, and we are, we are in a, a, a region that is a consumer-based region. Uh, in many ways, we import a lot of stuff. Uh, it, and it's, it's global. And the first wave, by the way, of internet adoption was always B2C. And, and so why are we criticizing the region and for what? I mean, I think we, we, we just self-criticize uh, self too much. We are, I mean, China, 
uh, and Alibaba were the first uh, adopters uh, in, in China maybe 15 years ago. And so why, why, why question that? It is just natural. Uh, people uh, do this naturally. It's the first part of the wave. Uh, and then eventually innovation comes with it, localization comes with it, Arabization comes with it. I mean, there's all sorts of stuff of particularity to the region that, uh, that comes out. And uh, you start with e-commerce and, and all sorts of technology pops up with it. So I'm, I'm you know, I am not going to, uh, you know, and then e-commerce is an ecosystem, right? So it's not only about people going and, and looking at a website or, or an app and buying something. There is a lot of technology that goes in there. There's a lot of uh, data that goes in there. There's a lot of analytics, a lot of AI, and then payments, and then last mile. I mean, there is, uh, this creates, and we need to think of it from the angle of the region moving from, uh, from only offline to online offline and creating a whole set of new jobs. And this, this is, at the core of what the region needs to address. How do you create the new economy and create new jobs with it? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Especially the part about us self-criticizing a lot. Um, Faraz, I wanna move to you. Uh, you went from Nemshi to Noon, uh, both of them you know, widely successful e-commerce platforms. I, I was wondering if you could share what drew you to the e-commerce space what, and what are you seeing uh, as the future? Um, especially from the position you're in with Noon being uh, the second largest platform in the region? Uh, well, if you start counting from two, I guess I'm kidding. Uh, no, but I think um, we, uh, no, thank you for having me. It's such, such an honor uh, to just be here. Um, look, we're, uh, I'd agree with Fadi, we're going through what the rest of the world is going through. This is really, a, uh, this, is, this is the mega trend of our times. Uh, retail is one of the biggest industries and it is sort of transforming globally. So um, in some form, what drew us to it was sort of the ability to paint. If you, if you want to paint on a large canvas, I think uh, um, this is the kind of sort of industry that will draw you to it. Um, but we are, um, and what's happening in our region is not dissimilar from what's happening elsewhere. I think uh, people um, underestimate the, the sheer pace at which our region is changing generally and how connected it is and, and, and how ready it is actually for disruption. So um, um, we're sort of, uh, we really believe and we say this internally at Noon a lot, which is, this is really the beginning of the beginning. It's, this hasn't even properly started yet. Um, and and um, so in many ways, uh, we see ourselves as sort of like at the starting point and we're really investing um, you know, um, we, we don't really, like, if someone says to me that they've shopped on noon, I apologize first. And I'm like, sorry, like, you know, you're, we're just still a baby and we're learning. But I really feel like we, we, we want to, uh, uh, that's the perspective we have. This is the start line. We, we, we believe that um, the region is getting ready for, like, you know, the companies and their revenues and the market share are going to be an order of magnitude more in, like, three, five, seven years. And um, all of us have to be ready for that because that means many things for the society we live in, for the uh, supporting infrastructure that is built around it, um, for the kind of businesses people will run. Um, and we see, uh, um, you know, um, so that's really what, I, what I'm focused on. I really feel like we don't look at what we're doing. We don't look at our, our, um, uh, any of this. We, we look at sort of what you have to commit to living in the future and you have to commit to living like three years out. And you have to build infrastructure for that because no matter what you do, if you're an e-commerce company, you will depend on warehouses and, and delivery fleets and payment systems. And, and those things typically take like, you know, a minimum of a year to two years to build. So I think um, we want to live in the future and we really want to believe that, that, that you know, th this thing has to be like five, 10 times bigger. And, and that's, that's what we're, so I, I, I get uncomfortable commenting on where we are or, or what's happening right now because it, it's really, uh, you know, this is a big bet in the future and, and really we're super focused in five years from now. Yeah, and but I do have to push you a little bit because you, you did launch a lot of new services, including your e-grocery offering, um, the Now Now, which promises uh, almost immediate delivery. How, how do you plan on making that sustainable? Um, look, we, again, I go back to this thing where, you know, I really fundamentally believe that our region is not different from the rest of the world. So if you look at like how markets are operating um, in North America or in, 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 in Indonesia or in Korea, um, there is a very deep sort of um, 
um, shift from uh, you know e-commerce companies being just e-commerce companies delivering tomorrow to hyperlocal local context delivery. Um, there is convergence of hyperlocal and e-commerce, and and uh, and those businesses all make or are beginning to make money or looking sustainable and are very relevant. So in some form, you again have to commit to living in the future, and you have to say even though it's not relevant right now, e-commerce looks very different. You know. Um, two years from now and we have to start somewhere and um, for the last one year or so like I've spent like 70-80% of my time on, on those like hyper-local platforms so in many ways it's not a new platform we really think that is the future of where we need to go and uh, a hybrid approach of like you know I love this so I'll, I'll speak to it just one um, I'll take a minute um, I love the mental model that the, you have to do what the customer wants the customer has a mental model of a store um, she knows where that like, you know, uh, thing she wants is in the store and you know that is in that aisle on that shelf. Sometimes we are just about getting that product from the shelf to the customer and, and that's, that's great. Sometimes it's about value and, and we need to bring it from a warehouse outside the city and, and you, that's what the customer wants and that's really what we're committing to doing. Um, so in some form, um, you know, our business doesn't look like what it looks like right now and six months from now and, and I think... Um, uh, which is why now now which is our on demand service moon food which is our food platform daily which is our grocery platform are all um, very early, early attempts at what we believe will be our core business um, you know a year from now yeah thank you and i love that you referred to your customer as a she must mean that you very much on the top of your mind that your main consumer base is actually women which is a refreshing change to hear. Um, Mona, I really wanted to, to switch to you now. Uh, I have a lot of friends who use Mums World, so um, well done on what you've managed to accomplish as one of the fastest growing e-commerce platforms. But I do know uh, from a focus group that we held earlier um, last year that when the pandemic started, although a lot of people moved to online, that didn't come without challenges. And I was hoping you could share with the audience and with all of us uh, what it was like to be in the e-commerce space when the pandemic happened and what kind of challenges, I'm sure it was not easy, although it was a massive opportunity, it, I'm sure it was not easy to be able to respond quickly to the high demand. Good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, as mentioned earlier, we started the year with uh, GCC e-commerce representing roughly $22 billion, and it was growing around 30% annually. And almost overnight, COVID came upon us and accelerated that pace. Um, just as customers were restricted in mobility, um, online shopping no longer became something that was nice to do. It became actually inessential. And if you look at a vertical like mother, baby, and child, where essentially most of the products on our platform are mother essentials, whether you're talking about diapers or wipes or milk or food, um, this became for the mother oftentimes not even um, a mandatory, but an emergency product that she had to have. Um, the challenge was just as the customer was restricted in mobility, so was the supply chain. And at one point, the supply chain came to an immediate halt. Um, so suppliers were not able to import products. Uh, smaller suppliers um, that had limited uh, cash flow were shutting down. Um, the region was very fluid. Um, every day bought with a different challenges. So we had to be um, adaptable and flexible as the ecosystem was learning um, with this learning about this, uh, this uncertainty. Um, in addition to suppliers uh, operating in uncertainty, the last mile providers also came to a halt. Um, in markets like Saudi Arabia, there was a time in March and April where um, the largest of the couriers were at a standstill and were unable to get products to the customers. Um, in addition to what was happening outside, what was happening inside internally in the organization was also shifting. So our operating rhythms uh, shifted. Our staff were working remotely, not in the office. So the communication channels suddenly uh, broke down. So you had to reinvent the way you communicate with the customers and and the way you communicate internally. Um, if you look at um, the most critical part of our business, which was the fulfillment center, the nature of the fulfillment center is to operate in proximity. So you have the pickers and the packers and the quality checkers um, moving your products uh, from the supply chain to your customers. And we had to reinvent 
the way we were operating within our fulfillment center to mitigate risk for both our team as well as the customers. So in that ecosystem, a lot had to change. Um, the first thing we had to do is we had to say, what is important to the customer of today? Um, so last mile was split into multiple shipments. We began treating our customers like emergency customers, handling all of the critical products like they were emergency products, delivering them within four to eight hours with our own fleet, as opposed to depending on last mile providers. We also started looking at um, um, different subscription models, different membership models that allowed customers to access products faster. Uh, cashless uh, deliveries became important. Again, keep in mind that this is a region that's predominantly cash on delivery. In Saudi Arabia, the majority of orders in e-commerce are cash on delivery. So overnight, we were switching that off. Now, the good news is that even while we switched cash on delivery, the demand remained high. And this was really a reflection of the necessity of e-commerce during these uh, COVID days. Um, the good news is that we came out of the other side or um, as, as, as far away from the other side as we can with, um, with an enhanced operation and a better understanding of the uh, consumer. We understood that in today's uh, world, the need for fluidity, agil agility, um, and disruptive solutions that were always one step ahead of the consumer were um, essential to our survival and growth. Um, we understood also the need for fluidity in our operating rhythms. Um, and the important thing is the customers who were loyal to us before the pandemic became more loyal because we rode that wave with them. And the new incumbent, the customers who experienced e-commerce for the first time realized the magic of e-commerce in accessing depth, breadth, speed of, uh, of access to products and price uh, transparency. Um, Mona, I, I just wanted to get your opinion. Uh, how do you feel as we're still in the pandemic, obviously, I know that things are slightly different in the UAE, but in other markets, um, there is a lot more lockdown. Things are opening up a little bit more in the UAE and across the region. Uh, how do you think things will evolve as the pandemic ends? So I would answer this uh, two ways. As in, do you think there will be a regression in consumer behavior? So look, we, we, started the, we started the pandemic with an estimated 2% penetration into the Middle Eastern household in e-commerce. Today, it's estimated to be 8%. That's a revolutionary trend in a very short period of time. Um, there are two things that are happening as we speak that will continue this trend. One is from an ecosystem side and the other from a consumer side. Um, from an ecosystem side, the reality is, and Fadi mentioned this earlier, E-commerce does not operate in a vacuum. In order for you to be successful in e-commerce, you need to be operating in an ecosystem that has enablers that support you. So couriers that understand um, the need for speed and accuracy. And by the way, when I'm talking about speed, it's no longer the traditional uh, five to seven days or even two to three days. Today, we're talking about you know, four to six hours. So the price of competing today is immediate gratification. And couriers DNA has to shift because of that. The other one is suppliers. Suppliers can no longer work on obsolete, uh, non-transparent systems. Um, it has evolved significantly and the, the integration between suppliers and retailers is very real. Um, and it's a symbiotic relationship and uh, suppliers are recognizing that as well. Um, the other part of the ecosystem is payment uh, options and payment gateways. You know, when we started Mums World a few years ago, there was one payment gateway in the region. A couple of years later, there were a couple, but they were uh, price prohibitive. There have to be payment gateways that are affordable for both the business, the retailer, as well as for the uh, customer. Um, and there has to continue to be innovations around not only payments, but safe payments. So buy now, pay later, uh, safer cash on delivery, subscriptions, memberships. Um, a lot of innovations are already starting out there. So that's on an ecosystem standpoint. From a customer standpoint, the reality is, um, look, the customer of today is very different. 
Um, she's very discerning, she's smart, um, she wants choice, she wants transparency, she wants immediate gratification, and guess what? She has options. Um, and so insofar that you as a business can give her that better and faster and uniquely, then you have an added value. For us at Mom's World, you know, we're building this business not just as a transactional e-commerce play. We're building a community that's transactional and experiential. So the customer comes to us for the widest range of products at great prices for a community that, that she can tap into and feel that she belongs to. And this intangible belonging, this intangible experience is eventually what's going to differentiate one player from the other. And I will say one final thing on that, and that is we are in a world today where we really are targeting customers to the power of one. It's no longer about segmentation. It's no longer about you know, looking at customers demographically and psychographically, that's 10 years ago. It's about how is Muna different from Dina, different from Sherry, and how do we talk to these consumers in that power of one narrative? And this is really what, uh, what we are uh, uh, striving to do and what will make e-commerce not only survive for the next decade, but thrive and really re reshape um, the way we operate um, yeah. with consumers. Fantastic. Um, Hamad, I want to switch to you because you do represent one of those uh, ecosystem players that allow e-commerce to thrive, which is fintech. And uh, you co-founded Faudi, which many believe to have inspired so many other entrepreneurs to enter the fintech space. And now you're the managing partner of Disruptech and you are actively investing in fintech. How do you think uh, how do you think the growth in e, uh, e growth in e commerce will impact the fintech space? But also, how do you think fintech will continue to enable the future growth of e commerce and sustain what is happening now post pandemic? Okay, thank you for the question. But let me just take you one step back. I mean, um, please before you always the pandemic, take us a step back. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. I'm just saying is that uh, the whole world, the whole world was moving online. It is not only commerce. It, we're talking about the government services. We're talking about other uh, services that were offered online at a faster pace. Our our region was going online as well, but not at the same pace. Um, what happened with the pandemic is that he tried the. What's happening is that the region are trying to catch up very quickly. Uh, and for that, there is a group of services that are going to be affected that we, we call it stay at home services that are highly affected by the work from home new practices and the uh, social distancing practices. And this uh, affected the whole consumer behavior as mentioned by my colleagues here. Uh, one thing that was clear in our region is that the digital services or digitization activities were ahead of pain. So, uh, and this was, uh, you can live, you could have lived with it in countries where there is, uh, I, I would say, uh, let, let me just clarify this, it was manifested in the cash on delivery percentage of the transaction that's happening in e-commerce. So you can do transaction, but when it comes to payment, you have no option, you have to do delivery. That was the most inefficient of the cycle. So. What's happening with pandemic that is pushed a lot of people to do digital payment. And that has happened through a positive shock that happened. If people were reluctant, were not comfortable, would, did not use the payment system or digital payment system very effectively in the past. But when they are forced to do that, they used it and it worked. That This is the good surprise. When it works, I, that, that's why I'm trying to uh, co continue the, the question that you asked to Mona. And I say, yeah, I don't expect uh, a great regression. On the contrary, because people now, were forced to say something, and because it works for them, they will continue to use it in the future. E-commerce is more more uh, convenient, and payment is. And I think globally, and if you look at, um, uh, uh, I believe that our region is closer to the to the east rather than to the west. So we are closer to China, India, and Far East model. And you look there, the big guy, the big guys in e-commerce, Alibaba. Uh, and others are definitely have an authentic arm or a payment arm because it is coupled product. If you want to increase this, you have to have uh, 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 a, a, a component that has to do with payment. So uh, my my impression that this uh, uh, what's happening in commerce have a great positive impact on their payment because payment is always an enabler 
for the growth. Uh, and my perception, it is continue to be uh, going, uh, growing in the same direction. And what are you seeing, Mohammed? I know um, you're mainly focused on Egypt, but what, what are you seeing in terms of some of the new trends in fintech that are popping up or that have popped up over the past year? Uh, you yourself have already invested in a number of new companies through Disrupt Tech. Um, what are you seeing as some of the new trends in order for that catch up to happen? I think one of the things that's happening is the um, the, the massive investment that's happening from the um, uh, from different stakeholders, either financial institutions or uh, fintech companies, and even the government in the acceptance space and the issuance space. I mean, the the number of cards and number of wallets that have been issued in the last year or so are, are massively uh, much better or much higher in number than before this angle. Uh, and this is a tool for 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 consumer to use when they come to e-commerce transaction. The other one is also mentioned previously by Mona is the uh, trying to finance the supply chain. So either finance the e-commerce provider in terms of his capital needs by uh, trying to offer him uh, a credit uh, for to start to to bridge the gap for his working capital, or what's uh, something like pay now. But why now pay later product that are trying to finance the consumer? So these two elements of the cycle, I think they will be growing very fast with the e-commerce growth as well. Fantastic. Wonderful. Sherry, I wanted to move to you and maybe take the conversation to a little bit of a different level. Um, at MIT, you know, we spend a lot of time talking about the importance of ecosystems to support innovation and to support uh, the growth of entrepreneurship more broadly. Um, and as you can hear from the conversation, e-commerce has the potential to really impact economic growth and job creation in our region. Uh, I think in the long run, it really also has the ability to impact inclusive economic growth. I think e-commerce uh, with, with the rapid adoption of FinTech and payment solutions really does have the potential to also reach a much broader consumer base of those who have been traditionally excluded. Um, what, what, eco, what should ecosystem players be thinking about at the moment? And, and what role should risk capital specifically be playing in this? Because I know that is a specific interest of yours. Um, well, first of all, thank you, Dina. Uh, it is a pleasure to join this august uh, panel of, of leaders. Um, and I just wanna say thank you uh, for uh, the opportunity to be with you all this afternoon. Um, so, uh, the happy answer to your question is, I can refer you to a wonderful new report just available today, uh, prepared by both the Wanda, Wanda Group and Legatum Center, which actually <laughs> is a fabulous um, uh, spotlight on a number of the, the concerns that you raise around. So how can ecosystem players do their part? And, you know, I think that what we've heard from all of the other panelists this afternoon sort of reinforces that. So uh, starting from government and regulators have all of the primary barriers to um, increasing uh, both the availability as well as the velocity of uh, e-commerce been taken. So is that uh, softening borders, is that uh, creating unified markets? I think those are all very, very uh, important considerations. And so, you know, making sure that the government, which always has a major role um, and seat at the table, is engaged in that uh, uh, easing of uh, artificial restrictions. Um, then I would also say, you know, looking, looking at, at Faraz and, and Mona, that uh, the large incumbents really have to lead the way in uh, living in the future, as Faraz says, I love that, um, building the infrastructure necessary to be able to uh, uh, power what will happen, not just today or next year, but in the short and medium term going forward. Um, I am a big believer in, uh, and I think this is very consistent with Legatum and your own perspective, Dina, around um, 
shaping the social conversation uh, around e-commerce, around technology, telling those hero stories, making sure that every little girl growing up in the region knows the story of Mona, uh, making sure that the positives and benefits of uh, this digital transformation are clear so that there is buy-in, not just from the relatively small slice of folks whose day jobs are inside technology and, and innovation, but that the moms and dads of uh, the folks who have those jobs um, see it in a positive, constructive light and understand uh, the broader uh, uh, advantages of uh, a larger world that includes the benefits of technology. So, you know, getting, getting right, the telling the story piece. Um, uh, and then I guess to your specific question around money and how uh, investors and investment um, should be thinking about it. So I'm a big believer in the concept of um, what somebody in Silicon Valley calls camels, um, which is rather than the kind of um, goofy non-existent notion of unicorns that uh, for many regions, including in the United States, the best model for growing uh, companies is not with enormous massive amounts of burn, but actual capital efficiency from day one, where unit economics makes sense from day one, where the investment uh, is in place, right? So there is capital to scale and scale quickly when things like the pandemic occur so that, that there is that ramp to move, but that there is a focus on uh, uh, good basic discipline that in a, in a world that, or market that may be more volatile, allows companies to actually grow without the excess of uh, what we sometimes call blitz scaling, which is uh, burning money for no good reason, uh, rather than a, a, an attempt at grabbing the market. Building for long-term growth um, is the, the camel approach. And it's one that I have seen really succeed in market after market. Um, you know, everything from Atlassian coming out of uh, uh, Australia, which didn't raise a single dollar of um, outside money until it had been in operation 12 years, to the nice provider bringing us all together this afternoon, Zoom. <clears throat> I took a look, <clears throat> excuse me. Yeah. Yesterday, Zoom um, had a market cap of $100 billion. It never raised <clears throat> from investors more than 100 million. That's a tiny, tiny ratio compared to the typical Silicon Valley um, blitz, blitz scaling startup. So yeah. I guess those would be my observations. Yep, uh, and I, I, I saw Fed United nodding his head a bit because I, I know he had made similar comments to this right after the pandemic started in some conversations. I don't know, Fed, if you wanna quickly comment or add on. Yes, well, thank you for mentioning blitz scaling, um, uh, uh, Shari. Look, I, I, Reid Hoffman is a friend of mine and I, I had, uh, I had uh, an argument uh, with him uh, right before the pandemic and, and his um, co-writer, I forgot the name of the gentleman who, who wrote mm. the story of blitz scaling. And I said to them, look, you, can, you cannot talk about blitz scaling to startups who are not in the United States of America or in China. The rest of us live in a severely friction-full world. I mean, <laughs> everything we do is about friction. How are we going to scale very quickly if every time I want to move, there is somebody that's going to tell me, oh, okay, no, well, there's a border here. There's a regulation here. There is uh, something that you cannot do here. You cannot do digital payment. And money maybe is scarce. I can pay you, you know, uh, Muna knows and others know if you're raising money you'll find investors that give you a, mil a million here, a million there. There isn't a million dollar, a hundred million dollar check here. They don't exist yet. So how am I going to blitz scale if, if, um, if my pockets are not full of money that I can burn? 
And so, and so the region is full of people, and that's where you need to study, is full of people who uh, have learned the art of uh, actually creating uh, unit economics that work, because they have to. And, and there's, there's nothing better for an entrepreneur uh, to actually be creative uh, than to basically not give him all the money that he needs, right? So they become very creative. But let me give you a beautiful example of this, uh, other than my two good friends here that are in the business. Uh, Instashop, the most, mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. most successful, the most successful, uh, uh, e e probably e-commerce company here in the region with all due respect to everyone in the grocery business is, uh, uh, did not raise more than $10 million here. Right, so, and, and the founder who is a fantastic entrepreneur understood how to run his business. I mean, I, I still can't understand that he only raised $10 million and then eventually sold it for 300 uh, uh, and so maintained uh, a profitable he didn't burn much cash. But uh, anyway, so the region yeah. cannot get scale. It can scale. It can do a fantastic job. But as I always say, it's a cliche and people uh, you know, will say, or Fadi says this, entrepreneurs like Faraz and Muna uh, and Muhammad Ukasha and so many others are heroes because they, the issues that they face, you're not going to face in big markets. You're not going to face in markets that have no borders. Uh, you're not going to face in markets where the regulator is geared towards talking to companies. Our regulators are just waking up thanks to pandemic, uh, just waking up to saying, OK, can we start having a serious dialogue about the digital economy, the 21st century economy, the knowledge economy? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, it sounds like you have... Go ahead, Mohamed. Let me make a quick comment on this. Uh, Fauri raised less than $10 million to be a $2, $2 billion company now. So that's an interesting comment. Thank you for that. But yeah. I mean, the, the, base, the base that we're working with was different. So now the market is moving at very fast pace. If you do it, the Fauri story now, you will not make it. You need really a good money to scale. So. Um, Fantastic. It sounds like we have another topic to write about for Wamda and Legatum, and maybe Sherry will take part in that one. Um, I wanted to shift uh, to one last question, or maybe two last quick questions, and then open up for some questions from the audience. But I wanted to address this to Faraz and to Mona in specific. Um, so, and this is even relevant, our study really only focused on the UAE, Saudi Arabia, and Egypt. And, and those three countries really account for 80% of e-commerce in the MENA region. I, I would love to hear both of your thoughts. And for us, let's start with you. Um, what, what is happening in these three countries? How are they different? But also, why are the other countries lagging behind? And uh, can, we bring them, can we bring them on board? Uh, we only operate in these three countries. I'll, I'll, I'll comment on that. I think um, uh, the, the three markets are very different. I think, uh, fundamentally, they sort of... Uh, yeah, you know, you have to think of, the, of them extremely differently. And I think they have different growth profiles. I think there is one sort of like general, I think Mona mentioned it a little bit. Fundamentally, all of these e-commerce companies are marketplaces and there's a demand side that is very, very strong across categories. The supply side has historically been like not as strong in, in some of the sort of uh, less uh, early adopter categories, right? So um, I feel like uh, what the pandemic has done, um, particularly sort of, um, for, for horizontal marketplaces like ours is that it's it's sort of converted a lot of internet users into online shoppers. And online shoppers used to be in fashion or in electronics have started buying uh, more horizontally or across categories in, in a more um, frequent slash and for us reliable way. So I think um, e-commerce becoming a true utility is happening. And I think um, uh, in that sense, the, the, the UAE and Saudi market are, are very mature. Um, uh, even if you consider like global standards of retention and, and, and repeat purchase and customer frequency of customers who are shopping, our markets are right up there with some of the most, some of the highest performing well penetrated markets in the world. And that's the, um, that's the truth. People, when they use e-commerce, they use it as frequently as um, some of the other markets that you sort of like sometimes look up to. Um, what is, what hasn't happened um, sort of at, at a very large scale yet, which will I hope happen uh, soon, is that uh, a vast majority of internet users are still not shopping online, right? So I think, um, or not shopping online or that, I think that that is one big shift. And I think uh, for us, um, 
um, the, the pandemic sort of got people to try it and then the experiences were sort of uh, given the supply chain sort of um, um, constraints, uh, not that great, but I think people have, have moved online in a very big way. Egypt looks, uh, uh, Egypt is a very different sort of uh, market you have to think. I mean, it's almost unlike the UAE and Saudi, you have to like, most regional companies operate in the three markets, but do not like Egypt is, looks more like India, frankly, like than, 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 than Saudi. Uh, as far as the e-commerce sort of um, dynamics are concerned. And I think um, there you you tend to see different categories do well. Uh, and I think um, to have a very, very localized approach uh, for each market is, is important. Um, and you need different muscles for different markets. I think that's the other point I wanted to make. Um, in Saudi, you to do really well, you have to be, uh, you have to have a 200 city aperture and, and really build for that. Um, in the UAE, you can like, you know, give a package to a third party delivery company and they'll do a really good job delivering it the same day, which is great. So you, you, need, you need to have a, you need to be great on another, another dimension. And Egypt, you need to be great at everything, right? So, so I think uh, those are different markets and strengths you need are across these axes. And you sometimes have to like calibrate very carefully. Um, and, and hence the, uh, both the horizon of investment and, um, and, and sort of um, actual, commercial acceleration needs to be calibrated um, um, on, on these dimensions. Um, but but I, I think uh, um, that might be too dense for like, I mean, maybe I'm just talking about my problems, but like, I think that's my perspective on the market. That's quite all right. Mona, do you have anything to add? Um, no, so, so, so I echo what Faraz said. For me, really, um, Saudi, Egypt are, are the largest population centers in the MENA region, so it's natural for them to have the larger portion of the pie. Uh, we um, at Mums World, though, were seeing faster uh, growth in other ROGCC markets like Kuwait, for example. So we've seen that the Kuwait e-commerce customer is actually much more sophisticated. Traditionally, that customer has been purchasing from abroad um, and supply access to supply in Kuwait, Qatar, Bahrain, Oman has been traditionally very limited. So very high demand. But again, I go back to what I said earlier, demand is great, but if you don't have a, um, an ecosystem infrastructure that supports that demand, then there are limitations in how fast you can grow. So you look at things like supply chain, infrastructure readiness, um, availability of couriers, um, number of suppliers, even suppliers setting up shop in these respective markets. All of these today are, are limitations to these markets being almost self-sufficient. Uh, but definitely high demand coming from these areas. What we're finding is we're finding um, fantastic unit economics coming from these markets, which is testament to the fact that demand is there. So you have high basket, high profitability in these markets, high retention, high lifetime value. Again, we look at these markets as our little gold mines. Um, so just imagine what would we, what would happen if infrastructure was to become more sophisticated, how you know businesses like ours and the customer can benefit. Right. So I think essentially we really need to, to focus on supporting the growth of that infrastructure in other markets. I have one last question. I promised Triska I would add, ask this and then I'll ask a couple of questions from the audience. So prior to the pandemic, uh, the region's e-commerce sector was attracting a lot of attention from China while Amazon of course uh, retained its Western, maintained its Western focus. Um, I think this is more for Faraz and Mona as well, but all of you, uh, will China continue to influence the e-commerce space in, in MENA? post the pandemic? For us, this is for you. <laughs> <laughs> I did not uh, want to pinpoint, but please, Faraz, take it on. <laughs> no, uh, look, I, uh, this, uh, China continues to inspire all of us, right? Like you, uh, you, you there's so much, uh, so much happening there. But I think uh, um, I, I'll see this one thing, which is that, um, you know, as e-commerce grows up, um, if you will, right? Like as, it mat as the market mat matures, um, the, the local supply context uh, becomes more relevant. People start shopping for things that you can't fly in a package from like um, across the world. So, um, uh, you know, um, it could be like, a, um, you know, a, you, you can't fly a mattress um, on an aircraft. So it, it, the supply advantage actually vanishes. You actually have to be very focused in, in local markets. You have to have local sort of, uh, sub, you know, demand context and, and build for that. Um, so, so I think, you uh, um, my mental model around this stuff is um, we have to look outside to um, see where the where the customer where the more mature customers gone and build those capabilities because no doubt our customers will, will aspire for the same things and, and will hold us to the same standard. But there's a certain limit to cross-border e-commerce. 
Um, and as e-commerce grows up, it, it mimics retail, like like Fadi was saying. Um, and in in many ways, like uh, the 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 consumption will shift towards grocery, and e-commerce will also like you know go in that direction. Um, I think there's a certain limit to what cross-border companies can do, and and hence there's a place for local uh, champions, vertical leaders, horizontal leaders, and and we'll see a lot more uh, of these vertical champions emerge. I hope uh, as infrastructure also improves. Great. I'm going to take some. Go ahead. I'll just add one point on, on China. One of the things that we discovered during the, the COVID pandemic is the importance to be less dependent and less reliant on any particular either suppliers or, or customers, et cetera. You really do need to diversify your dependence. Um, and so now with the rise, as, as you become very intimate with the customer and you understand their true psychographics, a private label, developing uh, products that you know are relevant to that particular region, et cetera, becomes more important. So China has proven to be very relevant uh, for uh, tapping into a supply chain that uh, historically was not uh, as accessible, whether it is alternate source of uh, brands or private label brands for uh, cheaper production. Um, so for us, uh, we see China um, definitely becoming more front and center um, across the entire supply chain. Okay, Fedi, did you want to say something quickly? I wanted to say something quickly related to uh, to uh, to uh, the enablement of uh, in in marketplaces and and in social uh, media, the social selling uh, that enables small and medium sized and micro. Let me not even say medium sized. I mean Egypt. I when I go to Cairo, I haven't been since the pandemic. But before the pandemic, the social sellers in Cairo, in Egypt, uh, is mind boggling. The amount of last mile people, the amount of people that are selling micro products online is staggering. Millions and millions of packages every single month. I'm talking about Cairo alone. I think this happens in, uh, in, uh, uh, in Saudi Arabia also, but you know, uh, I'm talking about Egypt because Egypt is, is, is moving very rapidly in, 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 in digitizing uh, the e-commerce platform. I mean, Fauri is at the forefront of it, but, but that is changing uh, the way the country consumes today. Yeah, absolutely. I have to say that even when I was last in Egypt, uh, I was with my, every day, my sister would get a package, which was like a whole other uh, new thing um, that, that I had witnessed in Egypt. So very quickly, I'm going to ask a couple questions from the audience, and I would like you to respond very quickly. So one question is, um, when looking at e-commerce in the region, do you think its growth now is more driven by the adoption of digital payments and online payments, or is it a result of the advancements in logistics and last mile delivery? I think uh, I'll go quickly on this and then let the rest. Uh, I think last mile is, is catching up to the, to the client. I mean, it's not the other way around. Uh, last mile came late to the game. I mean, I, I am, I'm, I'm very experienced in this stuff. We, we came late to the game. Uh, I think there are a lot more innovators on the ground and, and we are catching up to what the e-commerce uh, companies are actually being asked for by their, by their clients. Yeah. Um, the pandemic incentivized creating hyperlocal supply chains, and Mona, you spoke a lot about this. Uh, what, what, what is the role e-commerce platforms in digitizing the end market access? Uh, no, sorry, I'm reading the wrong question. Will this trend continue after the pandemic ends? And also, what is the role e-commerce platforms in digitizing, digitizing the end market access of producers who have been excluded from online, online markets? One or Faraz, whichever, whoever. I go for it. You, you want me to, okay. Yeah. Go ahead. No, no, go for it. I was just gonna. <laughs> so, so when we uh, when we first started, we took a in the early days, we took a um, a study that roughly fifteen percent, one five percent, and and I actually believe that number is 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 too high. I think it was much less. But 15% of retailers uh, who wanted to be online were actually online, not because they don't want to be online, but, but they, they simply did not have the capability, uh, the infrastructure, um, the capital to get online. So what's happening right now is you're seeing two things happen. One is you're getting the, the marketplaces of the world, the, the, the large horizontal 
verticals, the specialized verticals who are becoming that go-to destination, not only for the customers, but for global and regional brands who want to tap into the regional consumer. And you do that cost-effectively, you do that faster, and you come in into this ecosystem that's already ready. And, and we're seeing that already. So we cater to today about 5,000 brands who wouldn't, who, who wouldn't be online if it wasn't on a platform like ours. So this is uh, one thing that's happening. Um, the other one is the entire distribution network is being uh, disrupted. So traditionally, the distributors who've had exclusive rights to the region and have been accessing uh, retailers through these distribution rights, that's all uh, being disrupted. And we're going to see a lot more shifts to an open market uh, free for all. Taraz, you want to- Yeah, I'll just add to it. Uh, I think, um, so, so uh, you know, e-commerce platforms um, sort of are also evolving, right? Like where we actually see ourselves uh, the storefront or noon.com or our app is actually like one part of what we're trying to build. And, and we really believe um, our role is in building the fulfillment layer for um, retailers and for these small businesses. Uh, you know, we've got like 15 warehouses in, in key locations. Sellers can send stuff there. Um, if you're a small business, you don't want to like, ideally you should, you should like, you know, you, you want enabling infrastructure that allows you to run your Shopify store, but also allows you to like sell on a marketplace that has demand. And I think a lot of us, like these, like I can speak for Noon, uh, we see our role as an enabler where we will store goods for people. We will ship it um, for them, whichever website, like they got their order from, we'll ship it for them. We'll deliver it for them. We'll collect payments for them and, and, and give the money back to them. But also if the same inventory is live on our platform and we sell it for them, we're generating sort of like um, where we're becoming an incremental channel to their uh, um, uh, for, for their business. And I think that really is the cornerstone of like, uh, um, uh, I mean, I think most marketplaces uh, as they grow up in this scale, you become very large logistics companies that are in service of these small businesses who find customers and, and, and use us to serve them. I think um, th that's a role that's emerging. And I think already we have about um, 15,000 sellers who, who use us to yeah. store their goods with us and then we ship for them. Uh, I think that's that's really something that we see will scale uh, across market rates in the Middle East. Fantastic. Uh, uh, very quickly, and this is again to Mona and Faraz. Um, this is from Dana from Shopify. She says, thank you for this insightful webinar. This question is directed to both of you. Apart from an, intu an intuitive app site experience, what are you doing internally to further elevate the customer journey? Um, customers are more connected, resourceful, and demanding than ever. But very quickly, because we do have to end. Mona, or, Mona go for it. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we're building a 360 degree community for mothers to, um, and it's a transactional and experiential, experiential um, uh, offering. So uh, she comes to us to access the widest choice of products at transparent everyday low pricing and products that are unique and exclusive um, and particular to the mother, baby and child segment. It's, we are a vertical pure play. That's what we live and breathe. So our offerings um, are around uh, that, uh, that consumer. Um, community is a big part of what we do. Again, we believe that community is the sticky feature that gets people to come back to you again and again. It's that relationship that you have with that customer. It's that psychographic um, uh, advantage uh, that you have that perhaps another player uh, cannot have. So this is it uh, broadly. Fantastic. I know we do have to end and I know there are other questions, but I feel this is only the beginning of a conversation and I for one, you know, 10 years ago, I don't think we would have had a conversation like this with this much nuance with talks about localized supply chains and this much focus on the individual consumer. So as someone who has been in the ecosystem, I'm sure Fedi will agree. I can definitely attest that we've seen an enormous maturity. So I'd love to end, I personally like to end all my panels on the note of hope. Um, and I think we could all use some hope now. So I'd love for each of you to very briefly in 10 seconds, just say, what are you most hopeful about moving forward? Mona, can we start with you? for the, the Middle East region to continue to uh, grow and uh, thrive. This is my, my hope. <laughs> Mohammed, Akesha. You're on mute. Disconnected, sorry. Uh, I'm optimistic about FinTech, of course. I mean, I think the e-commerce drive will drive uh, FinTech further. 
So uh, many adoption, more adoption of the digital payment. Um, so um, that, that's the part I'm optimistic about. I mean, payment will explode in uh, our region and the most of the fintech solution as well. Inshallah. Um, Sherry. Um, <clears throat> so I would love uh, to uh, shout out for the empowerment that uh, each of you has described in your own day jobs that e-commerce and technology has brought to the customers and to your own lives and that that continues to grow. We've lived years in months um, during the pandemic and that from this new level uh, of engagement, they will be greater and uh, continued connection and community. For us. Uh, yeah, my hope is for, uh, I hope uh, businesses in our region can, can, can come out of this and, and hopefully um, use this shift in technology to, to, to be more sustainable and, 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 and thrive. My hope is for more hope for the small business, honestly. Teddy, you want to take us home with some uh, uh, comments of what you're most hopeful about? I'll, I'll take you home. I think, you know, in, in my years of, in the past 25 years of, of seeing what the internet has done to the world and what it has done to our region, I think I am extremely hopeful. The amount of entrepreneurs that I am seeing in the digital space today is staggering. I mean, it is unbelievable in this region. The hopeful message I have here is for the first time, I am seeing uh, the ecosystem starting to really uh, uh, talk to each other. So regulators, government, capital, startups, there because you know the pandemic brought everything home very quickly. Uh, everybody has been talking about the post oil economy. The pandemic brought it home and everyone, everyone is finding ways uh, in, 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 in enabling this, this ecosystem to happen. So that's, that's my, my hopeful message. And, and we feel it every single day uh, of operating in this region. We complain a lot, but it is happening. it's happening. Yeah. Well, you know, us Arabs, we like to self-criticize and complain a lot, but I'm definitely also equally very hopeful about what is happening in the region. And I'm very grateful to all of you for making the time. I personally learned a lot from this discussion. I'm very inspired by each and every one of you. Uh, I want to thank the audience for attending and uh, I look forward to more and please look out for what WAMDA and the Lagadam Center will be doing together in the future. Thank you.